things that also I think comes up very clearly, as I mentioned before, is the way in which the Net Oil Press has covered this question. Now, I think ultimately, as I said, what was also a few things that we didn't mention, which I think is worth saying about how the Australian particularly covered this, in all the coverage since roughly January, even when the motion was put forward in December, some of you may be aware, no one really took much notice of it, didn't get much press at all, I can't really recall, but it was essentially ignored, mostly. January's things started heating up during the summer, February madness ensued. Most of the articles, I can't have a figure, but let's say 95%, 98%, didn't feature two important points. Some would say essential points. Arabs, Palestinians, and the Soviet Union occupation didn't get mentioned. So all the poor, dare I say, dissident Jews, but putting, that, putting us aside, but there was basically no Arabs and Palestinians. In other words, it was almost as if the only people who should comment were white male politicians in Canberra who don't know a lot about the issue. And the wider context is that they were deliberately excluded. There's a few examples right at the end, before the election, where a few Arabs were given a line, which was nice, a couple of quotes. You can't trust those Arabs, as we all know, so you've got to give them too much space in the paper to be heard, but that's ultimately what was being said. Arabs have no agency in this debate. That was what was being said by the Federal Press. They have no right to speak about occupations of their own land. It's almost as if all we can hear about is a pro-Israel perspective. Of course, what is also a major disconnect between this position and what I said before is that in many Western countries, and America is a slight exception to this, public opinion is fundamentally changing towards being more, more pro-Palestinian. If you look at surveys in much of the EU, England, even in Australia, where the figures are not entirely clear, over the last five years, despite the fact that the vast majority of the press rarely hears much about Palestinians themselves. I can't think of the last time you actually saw an Australian publication, anyone published, who lives in Palestine, in their own words. In fact, I can't think of the last time you saw anything from an Egyptian or Libyan or anyone else, but Arabs in general, in fact, anyone who's not white, frankly, you don't really hear, you hear it through, a, through the voice of a journalist, and that may well be a good story to be done, but you rarely ever hear it in their own voice, is that public opinion is shifting, which is remarkable when you realise where are people getting that information from. If they're following most of the media, and there are some exceptions, they're not exactly getting a radical pro-Palestinian agenda, frankly. So where are they getting it from? That's a good question. I mean, there's alternative sources, uh, community groups, whatever it may be. There is a shift going on, and the people who are advocating against BDS and being very pro-Israel are aware of that fact, which is even more reason why in the last few years lobby, Zionist lobby trips to Israel have increased. Not decreased, increased. Many may not be aware of this, but every year, about two or three times, a lot of politicians, Labor and Liberal, journalists, editors, pretty much the vast majority of the establishment of the media in this country, Fairfax Press, Murdoch Press and ABC, go over there on trips to spend about five days in Israel and about two minutes in Ramallah, if they're lucky. And the thing that always I find extraordinary is that is needing to be done, so the lobby believes, to continue the illusion. And what also strikes me as remarkable in how this issue is covered, why the hell do the journalists who are going on these trips not think to themselves, I actually might go off the trip for a few, day, a few days. I might go try and go to Gaza. I might try to go to Nablus. I might try and see something that my little host is not showing me. And the remarkable thing is, last year, senior journalists from Fairfax, including Lenore Taylor, went to Israel on these trips. And before they went, it was announced that they were going, about 15 of them. It was the biggest delegation, I might add, that's ever been to Israel, led by Kevin Rudd. The biggest ever. You don't do that if you're feeling confident about things, believe me. You do it for the opposite reason, because you feel weak. I said before they left, I wrote somewhere that, rest assured, the message will be very clear whenever everyone comes back from the trip, it'll be about Iran, Iran, Iran. And guess what it was all about? Iran. Iran's a threat, we can't talk to the Palestinians because of Iran. Iran, Hamas, Iran, terrorists, Iran. You get the drift. One of the things I think that's remarkable about this is that we really have such a profound misunderstanding about what's actually happening in Palestine. Samar was explaining before. One can read about it now so easily. And yet, despite the fact that these sort of issues are increasingly known, the vast majority of our political elites either choose to ignore it or simply damn anyone who speaks out critically about Israel. 
And if you think there would have been some cracks in that, in the Labor Party today, in the Federal Labor Party at least, I'm happy to be correct this, I can't think of one person in the Federal Parliament who says anything critical about Israel, not one. Tanya Plibersek about eight years ago said a few critical things in Parliament when she was in opposition. Dare I say she said nothing since, and she recently even quasi apologised for those comments. Um, there's nobody. The Liberal side, it's almost a given. And I think it seems to us to, to understand that this is really not about Labor and Liberal at all. And you see this in America as well, and in fact in a lot of parts of Britain with the Tories and the Labor Party. There is complete bipartisan support on this issue, and yet the reason I think why what the Greens did with BDS and Marrickville and the fact that I'm very pleased to hear it's going to be strengthened, continued, etc. There's no doubt, just as an aside about that, there were mistakes made about how that campaign was sold. There were, people have acknowledged it before, it could have been sold differently better by the Greens at times. We all know that. People learn. But the ultimate truth is that it's been maintained and expanded. And I think Sylvia is right about this, that in many parts of the community, probably more in the inner cities to be honest, this issue does have resonance.